Eric, why don't you take it away? Okay. Yeah, we're good to go. Uh, well, uh, what's happening in the Wasm world? Um, uh, I've been finalizing uh, implementation of the tokenization framework in the in the Wasm lib, mm -hmm. and that means uh, in three languages, of course. Um, we bumped into an issue because uh, so <clears throat> the tokenization framework uh, wants to use 256-bit integers to be able to uh, uh, have the supply, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that means that uh, we needed to support 256-bit integers, but there's no such thing in Go. So they're using big int, <coughs> which is uh, essentially an unlimited-sized uh, integer. Okay. Um, and then when I tried to use that in TinyGo, uh, it tried to pull in all kinds of nonsense, and it turns out that big int hasn't been properly uh, uh, partitioned, let's say. Um, they threw it all in one big uh, package, and that means that, for example, functions you hardly ever need, like the random function, is pulling in all the randomization stuff, which is uh, notoriously non-deterministic and we cannot use, and also it uses uh, in TinyGo, it, it references to the JavaScript uh, side of things, um, which we don't support, of course, because we're not running in a browser. In addition, it also has a, <laughs> a single line where they use the formatter to produce an error message instead of yeah. simply concatenating strings. And the formatter is also pulling, trying to pull in shitloads of uh, stuff because that one uses reflection. And uh, the implementation still needs a lot of JavaScript for that. And again, that's not there. So I was like, oops, problem. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the, then I had a little thinking session. And uh, well, in the end, I decided uh, I'm just going to teach the computer how to do uh, adding, subtracting, multiplication, division. <laughs> So I created my own version of Big Int, a very limited small version. Uh, you don't need much, right? You you want to be doing some adding and subtracting, maybe some multiplication, division, and modulo, and uh, that's about the gist of it. If you want more, then those are the basic building blocks, and you can create your own as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so... That's what I created. Uh, it also helped with another problem I saw looming, which was that uh, I wasn't sure what big end support uh, Rust and TypeScript were going to uh, provide yeah. and whether those were uh, compatible and deterministic in their actions uh, with respect to each other. So to prevent those uh, problems and have a consistent working uh, big integer, uh, yeah, I rolled my own, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. Uh, brought me back to pubic era where I did, uh, uh, where I created a trinary uh, multiplication and division and things like that. So uh, I've, I've I've done this before. Yeah, you had already had a. You'd... You could recall yeah. that experience, yeah. Yeah, the 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 biggest hurdle was the figuring out uh, how uh, division worked again, uh, because it, it's it's been a few years uh, since Cubic, of course. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's all working. It's uh, it's uh, uh, surprisingly efficient. Uh, I haven't even optimized it yet, so uh, for now I'm leaving it as is. I'm literally using byte arrays and uh, uh, a, a, a byte as a digit, essentially, uh, where you where you do multiplication uh, the same way you do it normally when you when you use the decimal system multiplication. Mm -hmm. 
you multiply digits, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you you add results together. Well, it's the exact same. And uh, division is uh, is using a uh, a trick to guess a first uh, division result, and then it uh, multiplies that division result back to see if we get over the the number. And if so, we repeatedly subtract uh, until we're at the at the point. And the the initial guess is such that we're never more than one or two off. So that's uh, pretty clever. Yeah, that that works pretty well. Uh, it's working. It's implemented in uh, in all three languages. So no, that's usually just a, a bit time consuming and not difficult once you have the first one running. And then uh, I did some extensive testing, uh, literally exhaustive testing, uh, where I was uh, just multiplying all all numbers from zero to uh, two thousand forty eight by all permutations of that. So li literally, let it run the tables of multiplication and and division and addition and subtraction. And then compare that to what uh, the standard 64-bit integer uh, set would be the correct result, and uh, let that run. And that that took some some time, and it found one or two bugs where I uh, was a bit too hasty. So that was a good thing. Anyway, that uh, seems to be pretty solid now, um, and that was literally the final part that I needed to finalize the. Tokenization framework in the Wassenblip side. Um, meanwhile, Yang Hao has been working on the uh, comment feature in the YAML file, in the schema definition file, mm -hmm. uh, which means that uh, you can put comments at pretty much any item in the YAML file. Uh, we, we now parse it ourselves, so those com comments are being uh, retained and properly uh, attached to the items that they belong to. And then when we generate the code, we can insert those comments in the code. So we produce code that has those comments in them. Uh, for one, it makes reading the code uh, easier because you have those comments available. Uh, but second, uh, if you are having uh, them attached to for example, the, the f smart contract functions or uh, state variables and such, <clears throat> then your IDE will uh, pop up those commands when you when you want, right? So yeah. you have direct access to uh, to documentation of your smart contract while while you are programming. So that's yeah, that uh, that's cool. a nice feature to have. That is a very nice feature. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, pretty far rounded off. Uh, Yang Hao is uh, finalizing some, some small things there. And uh, <clears throat> then I'm going to have to find a new task for him. Oh. Um, I don't know yet. Uh, need to think about that. For me, uh, my next step will be uh, introducing the tokenization framework on the client side. So I'm going back to uh, to to in, uh, implementing the client side, and yeah, that's going to probably yeah, you actually, be that, one, you, one or two weeks. Yeah, you've actually cranked through a lot. I mean, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, <clears throat> but that that's that's also uh, three languages, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I'm first going to do the usual Go, so that I uh, have a baseline, and then I'm going to go back to the TypeScript because that one is actually uh, important for the web development uh, people so that they can use the, the, the TypeScript uh, client interface. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still have to, well, we, we had a volunteer uh, who will help. Uh, I'm, I'm going to write down the, the design specs and I have a volunteer who uh, said he could then uh, easily implement the Rust site uh, for oh, me, nice. or, or at least help me with that. So that's good. Um, <clears throat> so that is the the main thing I 
going to be doing for the next two weeks or so and uh it's important because uh, i want that part to be solid as well and uh, meanwhile the rest of the smart contract team is working on uh, getting notes uh, running we uh we have so far uh, only done our testing on solo um but uh today the first uh single node cluster tests were passing so not all of them yet but uh, at least uh, we have something that uh, that seems to be uh, working okay so, so the single node single node on the EVM side uh, no this is this is this is literally uh the wasp cluster oh oh understood yes. okay right uh so far we we we've, we've run in the solo environment which is which is yeah, more yeah. of a simulated node environment right yes. so we haven't run a, a real node yet and uh, the sorry this yeah, this, this means this means the bn hornet nodes right i think yeah, they, yeah, yeah. i think this yeah. one is with the hornet node these first tests and we need that to uh, to be able to uh, have a cluster running at some point where mm -hmm. you can deploy contracts and not uh, erase every time after running, right? So that yeah. it, it will. That, <clears throat> that's uh, that's going to be a milestone once that is uh, is up and running. And actually, I'm I'm going to be needing that uh, because uh, I I need to be talking to a working node uh from the client software uh, oh, sure. side so i might i might even uh quickly switch back to develop to uh do some uh maintenance and, and such on the client side code to prepare it for the for the for where we're going with mm -hmm. uh with the stardust uh effort and then uh that at least I can I can have a talk to a node while I'm testing. So that's uh, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, the most focus of of the team is on uh, getting that part up and running, and we're also looking at several aspects of the EVM, um, uh, mainly on how to. Uh, uh, interface it properly with all the new level one features. Uh, we had a little discussion during the, the meeting this morning uh, about ERC20 and ERC721 tokens and the uh, possible problems that uh, they could uh, have if you let them escape outside of the contract, essentially. Mm -hmm. Because they're they're level one, you you could transfer tokens between people, right? And sure. uh, uh, ERC twenty and ERC seven to one, uh, their their uh, uh, their requirement is such that the contract at all times knows where the token is. It it keeps track of its own administration, but if people are moving to diff to a different address outside of the contract then uh yeah it loses track of the tokens and uh that's not something you want so uh for ecm to to work we probably will be using native tokens but they will be locked up in the contract uh and and not you won't be able to actually move them outside of that because otherwise you're, you're not uh working at erc 20 level anymore and you mm -hmm. cannot interface them with uh, with contracts that uh, at the Ethereum level uh, work as ERC twenty. So, and uh, I'm sure uh, I I indicated my uh, experience when I uh, when I was going through the ERC twenty and ERC seven two one on the Wasm side. Mm -hmm. Uh, the conclusions that I drew was like, well, this isn't going to work with our token. Yeah, I remember you saying we're, that. We're, yeah, we're going to we're going to need uh, a, a different kind of paradigm uh, in that respect. So, where we end up with that, uh, that's something. Uh, yeah, that, so that's, that's a TBD. That's going to be interesting. What the new best practices will be, right? It's just like ERC twenty 
uh, emerged as a best practice. Oh, sorry. Go away. Stupid Chinaman calling. <coughs> um, so yeah, uh, where we where we will end up with our best practices, we don't know yet. ERC twenty was something somebody built and then somebody copied and somebody else copied and then it grew into kind of a standard, even though it was uh, extremely simple. And then several newer ERC contracts uh, emerged as as slightly better or better suited for certain applications, mm -hmm. and and that's what I see happening yeah. in in IOTA at some point, uh, because there's there's no way that we yeah, it, it's it's silly to do all the administration in the smart contract when you have that functionality at level one. Yeah. Right? Um, on the other hand, it, it does reduce the load on the level one. So, yeah, well, it, it's going to be one of those fun trade-off things, I guess. But the fact that, it, that you have tokens that uh, that are let loose on level one you want to probably be able to uh, to 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 actually use that uh, and and freely transfer them without having to go through a smart contract. So just from what what the fuck is this? All this beeping. Do you have something you need to take care of, Eric? We can pause. No, I'm I'm oh. I'm just turn turn. I said I'm turning off the beep. To airplay mode, and it will show up. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so that's going to be that's actually something that uh, you guys just discussed this morning. Uh, was was it something that everybody was aware of, or were you enlightening people? No, no. Uh, the, the, some people had already encountered that, but I highlighted okay. it once more, and uh, others like Ivaldas uh, and. and and Jorge and uh, Diego, and they all agreed uh, that uh, that yeah, we 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 need some stuff, and that and that then moved towards uh, yeah, we should probably revive that uh, X team group, uh, and and well, the moment we we have something that runs, uh, have them uh, experiment with it and and see uh, if they. What what they can do with that stuff, right? Uh, we we I mean we're we're building a tool, but we haven't really unleashed all the potential of that tool yet, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see what people can come up with. And this is where where the X team uh, could, uh, mm -hmm. could make it make a dent and 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 make an impact. Sure. And of course, uh, the rest of the community, but uh, yeah. Okay, well, that's so interesting. I, that, that was just uh, nice timing with the fact that I had a, an X team meeting an, an hour later. So I thought I'd mention <laughs> that, that you guys haven't been forgotten on our side. <laughs> no, and I, you know, and I think our team would, uh, people would like to do that once we're, you know, ready to do that. And, uh, you guys are ready for for us to do that and get the other stuff in place so that we can actually test it properly, you know. Yeah. So um, that that was an interesting call. So we have we still have ways to. Sounds like we're having to do some still invention there um, and figure out how to do that. You're gonna have to make choices and figure out which one, what the the best choice tool for the job, I guess, really, the best approach for the job at, at hand and how you determine that will be interesting. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I, one thing I could see happening, for example, with NFTs is a decoupling of uh, uh, the administration of who owns the NFT mm -hmm. and the, the data associated with the NFT. So um, the NFT is owned by someone and the smart contract holds the extra data and anybody who owns the nft can do stuff in the smart contract associated with it and proving ownership 
is pretty easy. You just move the token to a new UTXO in your own wallet. And as part of a uh, smart contract transaction, and then the smart contract can see, ah, yes, this is the, this is the owner, so doesn't mm -hmm. need any more proof than that, and then it can act on that, right? So the trust level is, uh, is good at that point. But you, like I said, there's, there's going to be a separation of uh, keeping track of ownership is no longer a function of the smart contract. Mm -hmm. So things things like that. That that would be what what comes to mind top of my head uh, to to solve things like that. And the same thing goes for uh, ERC contracts that have. Uh, ERC twenties, for example, that have uh, flexible uh, uh, supply. So what we would do is uh, we would uh, lock the foundry into a smart contract, so that the the smart contract uh, can deal with increasing or decreasing supply, uh, mm -hmm. etc. And then the tokens can freely move between owners uh, on level one. And if if something needs to happen with those tokens uh, that is that is related to supplies, for example, people want to burn tokens, right? You would send them to the smart contract to be burned, and then uh, they will the smart contract will pass them on to the foundry it controls to make sure that the burning happens. Right, because you have the foundry there with you, so that whatever situation comes along, you yeah. don't have to reach out. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. But the smart contract does not need to keep track of who owns what token exactly. Yeah. It just needs to be sure that, well, it's going to be a, a whole different uh, set of rules uh, than you see with with ERC20 and, and all the other ERC contracts. But is you're referring this is what, to an what happens. You refer to an external source to determine who owns it, right? Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually... Uh, so... Normally, with an ERC contract, the contract decides everything about the token, right? Mm -hmm. Who owns yeah. it, uh, uh, how many, it, it does the movements for you, mm -hmm. uh, and then any extra things that it needs to do. So if you need a burn function, then the smart contract has a burn function, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all, most of that is now happening on level one. But it still needs to be controlled by a central entity, essentially. But one that runs freely, right? It's 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 like a more like a DAO mm -hmm. in that regard, an ERC contract. It's 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 something you can trust that works and nobody can interfere with. Essentially, that that's the whole deal about ERC. Right, uh, mm -hmm. you, you mint you mint tokens, but once you, once you mint tokens with an ERC, and 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 the the contract regularly implements ERC, then you know that it is a safe contract. And uh, well, of course, you need to vet it uh, and to be sure. But mm -hmm. the rules are clear what it does. So then, all the tools that use ERC can just use it and trust that it will do. What it needs to do in a in a safe way, or at least that's the whole idea. Mm -hmm. I I read something interesting uh, uh, this week, uh, and that is that a lot of smart contracts that are copies from other smart contracts that are that were proven uh, often are uh, copied and introduce a new token and whatnot. But they they modify a small thing here or there, and in in a large amount of cases, that small thing that has been uh, modified uh -huh. opens up an exploit. Of course, I mean it's all, it's predictable, <laughs> right? I mean, you have people, you have open source code that's being tossed around and moved from place to place, and all it takes is one person, innocently or on purpose, can go out and alter some code. No, no, it, this is not yeah. innocently. Okay. The fact right. that that, that yeah. pretty much there's only a single modification, oh, okay. right? So that it was opens intended. up an exploit. That's not yeah. all, that's not uh, okay. an accident, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. You you don't. Uh, what was that uh, that just popped up one or two days ago? A, a contract where the where some uh, withdrawal function all of a sudden was public. 
Mm. And, and, and so, so uh, people were using that uh, in, in, a, in a swap uh, oh, really? uh, system uh, to withdraw most of the tokens and thereby the supply in the swapping area reduced drastically. So the price of those tokens was, uh, flew up. Mm-hmm. And then the, they they quickly uh, swapped the withdrawn tokens on another place for the higher price in, into new into other tokens, right? <laughs> and, yeah, and, uh, yeah. They just abandoned those tokens. <laughs> <laughs> That's there's always somebody smarter, clever. So um, so th- can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Then, yep. Yeah. So um. So there's one thing about the EVM and its limitations, right? And the other thing is an is ERC standards, which I guess can also be implemented on a different architecture with possible extensions on Wasm, right? Have we basically uh, thought yes, through well, the input no, wait, output? Wait, one, one minute. One minute. Uh, the, the ERCs, right, they all have a set of assumptions built in. They are. They assume they're running on a, a, an Ethereum kind of blockchain, right? So you can implement that because we we can partition off code so that it stimulates that, like we're doing with the EVM, and you can do that in in Wasm as well. Uh, essentially, like uh, I created an ERC twenty contract. But it's a bit silly to keep track of of all the token movements inside the contract when the the tangle itself provides that functionality. But if you allow the tokens to escape from that control, then the ERC twenty contract no longer functions. So, right. right. So so you can mimic that same kind of behavior exactly because. That's that's the whole during completeness of uh, of the tangle and mm-hmm. and the ISC, right? So that's not a problem, but we have so much more possibilities. I am constantly grinding my teeth when I hear people focusing on the EVM, which is essentially we're limiting what the pot- potential capabilities of uh, of of IOTA. Are yeah, right. It, it's it's like we're 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 putting a a, a lawn mower engine into a port. Yeah, you're not even tapping the potential of of what you've yeah. built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could sense. I could see the frustration on that. It's like you know, you guys are just yeah, missing. But yeah, and, yeah, and to yeah. to me, sometimes it's a bit frustrating that all well. A lot of focus is on the EVM, uh, most communication internal in in, in, in mm-hmm. IOTA. They're talking about EVM, right? And we have this 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 vibrant, wide potential WASM ecosystem, and that it's hardly mentioned. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, like it's, the, it's, the argument, weird. of course, is okay. We want to get, uh, let's say, for example, the DeFi space up and running quickly. Oh, yeah, and, of course, that's the carrot. Getting, so and getting liquidity and all that. So um, how easy or how much harder or what's the trade-off going? Wasm, I think, is is the the question. Uh, conceptually, you know, it makes sense. We believe you, right? But. Um, the argument of saying, "Hey, you you need to change uh, one parameter, and you can run any uh, Ethereum smart contract on IOTA, um, and it's all easy peasy," is is uh, kind of an easy to understand argument versus saying, "Hey, you got to do more work, but uh, the promised land is really uh, uh, on the Wasm side." Uh, yeah, <clears throat> or but that that's a similar thing. Or on the EVM side, but then you get a kind of EVM plus, right? We we are we will be able to provide functionality in the EVM that isn't there in the actual EVM. Yeah, right. It, it EVM is now a core contract in the in the, in the WASP node. 
So it's it's just always there. It's loaded, and uh, you you can you can use it. You can start a chain with it, and uh, boom, you have an EVM ch chain running. And and essentially, it can it can work just like standard EVM. But we will have uh, possibilities to call other sandbox functionality that we have that is not available in the standard EVM. Right, so kind of EVM plus, and that that opens up a path towards uh, everything that the Wasm engine can do f from right. scratch because because it doesn't have to deal with the legacy code essentially. But if if you start doing that, then it becomes something that potentially doesn't interact well anymore with the existing DeFi stuff. So there, there's all kinds of trade-offs there. And uh, yeah, I, there, there's a lot of friction that, that you create. In sure. that once, you, once, you, once you make the choice to tap into Wasm areas, right? It takes you farther and farther away from the Ethereum world, which eventually means that returning becomes ever more complicated, right? And, and introduces new problems when people do that. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be interesting. Exactly. But Next. I like that EVM, EVM plus, and uh, Wasm. Um, you know, and having something like architectural guidelines and saying, "Hey, look, this is what you uh, get if you do pure EVM. Whatever, it's easy, fast uh, to do. Blah blah blah. EVM plus, with more effort and so on. That would be a nice uh, discussion. And of course, if there was something like a reference implementation where you could then show whatever, how many TPS does the smart contract now do and the tangle do in one or the other scenario that, so you could also say, do I, yeah. need that I mean, you know, this is, this is your world on, you know, this is, this is the performance you get in there in the AVM world. This is the performance you get if you tap into the WASM approach, right. And see the difference in performance. And, and that, that I mean, Ideally, that would be amazing, but that's also a huge undertaking where, where the code is at right now, I'm sure. Uh, but I would, I mean, I totally see where you're going. It would be pretty sweet if we could pull that off. Because, um, you know. Well, just look, yeah. look at, at one very simple thing the ability to swap tokens okay. between chains, right? Yeah. Uh, if, if you want to do that in, in EVM, in, in, in standard EVM, you have a lot of trust factors that are involved. And if you do that on the IOTA Tangle, there is no trust involved because it's it's secure. It's a secure swap, swap mechanism on level one. And those chains can interact between each other and, and affect a swap without having any third-party interaction whatsoever, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That that is that is something that is very desirable, essentially. But yeah. it, it it needs to use some special functionality that we provide to that EVM, right? And therefore, it 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 works slightly out of uh, out of bounds with a normal EVM. But if you have a bunch of DeFi running and you you kind of reroute a swap functionality in, in the swapping part of that DeFi system over the Tangle, then you can compare how fast it actually is because you have multiple tokens running in parallel on the same platform, right? And with an ability to swap, swap between them uh, seamlessly and securely and trustlessly. And so... That that's when all those uh, advantages of IOTA uh, can start showing. Yeah, it sound you know what would be really. I mean, it would be awesome if we could actually just do what you said, and actually kind of provide a uh, technical overview and even maybe a um, a YouTube type. This is your you know this is your world on Ethereum. This is on uh, and then this is. The, going through the same scenario with was yeah but well what, yeah. what we need to do is actually build something like that as as a, a proof of concept 
No, right? no, I'm, uh, I'm agreeing with you. Because, yeah. because yeah. Uh, it, it's all nice to say this is what will be possible on IOTA compared to look, this is possible on IOTA already. Right? That that whole difference, uh, all, all the in the future this will be possible stuff, uh, we've done that way enough in the past. I, I'd rather not do that again. <laughs> and yeah. and in, uh, as, as a segue on, on that, uh, one other thing that uh, we discussed uh, this morning uh, is the fact that uh, we're going to be focusing on documenting all the new stuff uh, in, in a kind of a sprint. So uh, once, once we have our basic functionalities running, uh, the main first focus will be not to iron out all the bugs, but actually uh, have some documentation uh, produced as, as fast as possible so that people can start playing with it and, uh, and actually understand. Because a lot of the documentation that's currently out there is outdated uh, so far that it's, it's, well, you have to read between the lines, essentially, uh, to understand things. Yeah, and that's not good. Yeah, I know what Alex is thinking, and and I, we, what you described is sure would be something cool if we could pull that off. I'll have to think about that. See if we can maybe yeah. find a way to do that. Pretty cool. It um, would be nice if, if, like, around the summer, we would have a uh, a first incarnation of. Uh, the Stardust slash Shimmer with documentation. Yeah, right? for uh, sure. That, uh, that, that is what we're trying to work towards. Uh, well, let's hope, hope we pull it off. It, it's, yeah, mostly the usual uncertainties when you're building stuff, like uh, what, what, what kind of problems do you bump into? Right. Uh, most of what we what we're now trying to do is just get all the all the old stuff up and running, all the old tools, uh, as far as 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 uh, is reasonable, right? For example, uh, uh, the the Wasp CLI uh, tool. Uh, yeah, we don't have a, a color token framework anymore, so all those color token commands uh, they they get dropped. But then again, we need to figure out how to uh, provide some access to the tokenization framework through that tool. So the, that's where the tool needs adjusting and adding. And that goes for most of the, of the changes that, that we introduced. Uh, the, they rippled through several tools. Yeah. That's always the issue, right? What yeah. you're doing like that. Everything needs to be touched, reconfigured, revisited, or thrown away. Yep. Yeah. Well, well that's, so it, that's me it, in a nutshell. Yeah. So it sounds like, uh, as far as the the, pro the progress of the project, um, that was a little interesting conversation this morning. But uh, are we sensing that um, some of the stuff, some of the other things in this uh, smart contract world are that they were trying to figure out have they are there any are there a lot of loose ends or are we knocking those down what do, you, do we still have some large pending items or what do you, how do you feel about things uh well it's it's mostly getting the notes uh up and running and uh, we we have a, a shitload of tests from the from the old system that we that we're running so it's not like we have we're having to build that from scratch but it's mm -hmm. it's a matter of getting those nodes working together, right? So because yeah. uh, instead of the Go Shimmer node, we're now talking to uh, either B or Hornet. Yeah. So that interfacing uh, needs to be ironed out properly. And then uh, all the tests that we're running uh, that are failing right now, we need to figure out why they are failing, uh, what's going on, and then fix that or 
or change the test because mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's no longer testing something that is sensible, right? right. But at least we have we have we have a large uh, baseline of tests that we can run and that will highlight any issues and any things that have changed, uh, and then we can adapt to that. Uh, and yeah, like I said, uh, our aim is still for uh, for somewhere around summer. Yeah. You have to have something. Uh... All right. Well, that sounds, um, I appreciate uh, that great discussion of the insights today we learned, uh, especially on the, on the ERC stuff. That's really pretty cool. Pretty good to know. Um, you know, one, um, one thought here is um, I know that there's a lot of uh, dependencies and there's always unexpected issues and so on. Yeah. Now, um, what, also from the German Stammtisch discussions, yeah. Um, one thing that's always uh, a bit confusing, I think, to people is that we don't seem to distinguish uh, clearly between development and working towards a release, yeah, versus research, right? So there's always like, okay, so we are figuring this and this out, and then you think, okay, now we are at the stage of refactoring and cleaning up code and whatever. Yeah. And then somebody throws another research thingy in there. Right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, yeah, and then, and then the specification, right. I understand that this is not my traditional ERP world where you actually write requirements and then a specification, and then you code something. And as a product manager, actually pray and hope that whatever comes out at the other end kind of looks like what you envisioned. Yeah. Uh, I know it's not working like that um, as you uh, try to be at the edge here, yeah? but um, this confusion about, you know, stuff that is future music, uh, research well, I, versus I can what's be coming. Clear, I can be clear about one thing. We as a team refuse anything they throw at us that is outside of what, what our current scope is. So if, if, if research come up with uh, the next uh, shiny object, like uh, <laughs> zero-knowledge wallops or whatever, we will give them a, a big finger and say, fuck you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, want, we, 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 are, we are so fed up with that kind of stuff. We want, we want this to work, and we want it to work solidly. That is our prior priority. We, we have a lot of functionality in there. Uh, we can do a lot with it. And only when it's actually out there on the mainnet will it be useful. It's time to ship code. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So that's, that's, that's our view on it as a, as, as a team. Uh, for well, let's be honest. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. completely, completely ignoring the whole assembly thing at the moment. That's that's so up in the air and 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 wishy washy and undefined as far as we are concerned. That we're like, uh, yeah, that's nice. We'll see that once we're done with Shimmer. That's that's when we start thinking about that shit. We're not going to think about that now and, and try to shoehorn that into what we're building now because it will only slow us down. That's a guarantee. I'll guarantee you that. Yeah. No. So, yeah. You can't, you can't build a ship if you keep changing the blueprints. No, exactly. Exactly. And uh, it's, it's, it's nice to announce shit, but uh, yeah. Get the damn boat in the water. For, for, why announce something before you even, even, even why, why announce an upgrade before you even have an actual system? I, I, I don't, I still don't get that. I mean, it's always a difficult balance. I mean, I, you know, I understand your frustration and, uh, but there is always a balance of making sure you maintain, you know, the cutting edge feel out in the marketplace. But I mean, at some point, you can't keep talking about how good it's going to be and um, and, and never ship, right? You just yeah, gotta ship exactly. It, right? It's exactly. like, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. So, 
you got to get the, you got you got to get you got to ship some stuff you could fix it update it upgrade it alter it hugely later but at least you got it out there and you have people actively building on it you know um, yeah because the perfect the test environment is only as good as the, as the test environment the guys who write tests right uh, you can't think of everything you got just got to get it out there expect that stuff's going to break and just yeah, fix it exactly. as quickly as you can so you know? our goal is to get things to a basic level of working where we are where we know there are still some bugs in there but we are reasonably uh, satisfied with the performance and and the uh, and, and, uh, the uh, uh, what do you call that uh, the accuracy mm -hmm. right uh, so that that we know that the bugs aren't crippling uh, or or introducing uh, errors in data that uh, will will throw off your your results or anything like that right so at, at least you can use it in a basic fashion and then uh, people can start using it and uh, please by all means report as many bugs as possible and then we'll fix those bugs as, as, as fast as possible right so then it becomes a matter of uh, setting up a, a bug repository and going through those bugs without any new functionality just fix bugs fix bugs fix bugs until until that list exhausts and uh, and only then we should start thinking about new functionality. Amen. As they say, so, preach. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, you know my handle, right? Bug free yeah. software. Yeah. Right. There you go. That that's that's not a joke. That, I know it isn't. I it, know. I I have created an application. Uh, with the complexity of Microsoft Access, complete with programmability and everything, right? Yeah. Uh, a, a contract management system. And I have been uh, working on that for 10 years in the past. And we had seriously large clients, large telecom uh, companies, banks, uh, government instances, uh, in insurance companies, uh, all the, those kind big companies that were using that software, right? And yep. they thought there was a whole team behind it. And it was me who was writing the code, creating code, thinking up stuff. And, uh, and I was the help desk. <laughs> and I got about two calls a month with bugs because of my philosophy, bug-free software, right? Yeah. Whenever I got a bug report, I dropped everything, fixed the bug first, shipped that fixed version to the clients. So they were very happy with the turnaround time, right? And I always had a solid platform to test on, to check on, to run on. I knew there were no other bugs. There was never more than one known bug. And then after that project ended, I, uh, I started working somewhere else. And they started really well. They, uh, they were going to do the, the whole... Uh, 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 unit testing thing and, and, and such, right? And then at some point, uh, we had to quickly, quickly do this. And then all of a sudden, unit tests started failing, right? And yeah, ignore that for now, uh, because we first need to get this out. And before we knew it, there were 30 or 40 unit tests that were failing. And so you could hardly notice a new unit test that was failing in the sea of failed tests. Mm. Right, and then it runs out of control, and yeah. I was like, "Why the fuck are we doing unit testing if we're ignoring the fact that the unit test says that it's not working?" <laughs> right, and this was with an entire, an entire freaking team, where I did it as a single person. I was able to keep it bug free. We yeah. should, we should be able to do that as a team. It's easy. 
Well, yeah, that, when, that's you're what, smart, when you're as that's, smart as you are, it is. <laughs> that's, that's the point. No, it's a matter of structured working. <laughs> I know. Not, no, bending, not bending your own rules. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I get it. Right? Oh, oh, this test fails now. Oh, you know what? Just skip the test for now. I'll get back to it later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And There's always sudden, something else that yeah. has higher priority than getting back to the test. That's true. There's always another fire. Yeah. 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 All right. So anyway, that's my rant. Cool. Um, any questions for um, Eric? No? Okay. I think we can wrap it up. Thank you, Eric. Got some sure. great insights. Uh, thank you, Kumar, for uh, helping me with the recording. And uh, we will uh, close this out, and we'll do it again in two weeks. Okie dokie. All, right. All right. Thanks so much. You guys have a good one. Bye-bye. You too.